All right. Let's All right. Well, good afternoon, all. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Jules Savad. I'm a genetic counselor with the Geisinger team um, at, and to help support Genome Connect. Uh, joined by a couple of folks here from the National Brain Gene Registry who are excited to share more about their uh, work and their research study and how it interacts and overlaps with Genome Connect. If we could go to the next slide, we'll start with a few housekeeping pieces. Um, so first up, uh, this is not our first webinar of the year. I think some of you may have joined us for webinars earlier in the year, starting first with the importance of individuals sharing health and genomic data in February, and then a, a DNA day, how to read a genetic testing report with one of our genetic counselors. Those recordings are available via YouTube. The QR codes are there on the screen. Um, and uh, we welcome you to take a look at those recordings. We will record today's webinar as well. Um, we'll learn more about the Brain Gene Registry today, as I mentioned. And we do have a fall webinar uh, scheduled for October 16th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, all around ClinVar, um, the database where we share genetic and health information, how to search that database, how to track variants in that database. So if you're interested in that, uh, stay tuned for more information from us about how to register. Uh, and we look forward to folks joining us there as well. For those uh, who registered and provided questions before today, we really are appreciative of you taking the time to do so. You will have the ability to ask questions during our discussion. We should have some time for Q&A at the end of our conversation. You won't be able to unmute or come on camera, but you are able to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and our team will be moderating that. We'll pose questions to uh, the team that's on the call with us today. So feel free to use that as you have questions um, and as we're, we're chatting. On today's call from the Genome Connect team, I've introduced myself, um, but we're also joined by Caitlin Cooney, who's a genetic counselor that supports Genome Connect, and Madison Brown, who also is on the Genome Connect team, is a genetic counseling assistant with us. We'll really be here just to facilitate discussion, uh, backup technology, uh, but we wanted to share a little bit about who was joining us from Genome Connect. So I've said a lot about Genome Connect in terms of our webinars um, and who is on our team, but what is Genome Connect? I know we likely have a mixed audience, some who've heard about Genome Connect previously, some who are participants, others who might be less familiar. Genome Connect, for those of you who aren't aware, is the ClinGen Patient Registry. It's really focused on collecting genetic and health information from anyone who's had genetic testing. It's an online registry, is available in both English and Spanish. Participants sign up and consent online uh, via our HIPAA secure platform. And then they share data with us in a couple of ways. First, they provide their health history via survey. So surveys that really try to capture their health history from head to toe. And then they share their genetic test reports with us by uploading copies to their accounts. Um, those genetic test reports are then reviewed by our study staff members. So Caitlin, Maddie, and myself. Um, to pull out the structured genetic information. We then take participants' uh, genetic information from those reports, their health history information from surveys, de-identify it, so remove things like name, date of birth, and share it with a database called ClinVar. ClinVar is a submission-driven database, meaning that it's a database where uh, many groups, so laboratories, clinicians, patient registries like us, submit data so that it's out there in the public space and can be used as clinicians are getting test reports back, as labs are performing testing. Um, and it's a really important database to help us understand the relationship between genetics and health. Within Genome Connect, participants can also connect with one another. Um, they can learn about additional research studies, can remain engaged through educational resources, um, and we also give them the opportunity to receive updates about their genetic variants if we learn about them through our data sharing. Um, so I wanted to give a snapshot of what Genome Connect is. Um, and on the next slide, we don't just share data from Genome Connect. So Genome Connect recognized that there are a number of external registries and studies, all that are collecting really wonderful health information. Maybe they're collecting genetic information, 
but they might not be sharing that with that ClinVar database. So a few years ago uh, in 2018, we started working with other groups to share data with ClinVar and figuring out how best their registry could get data into that uh, database. So we work with registry studies really on a case-by-case -case basis, exploring what do they need consent-wise, data collection-wise, data sharing-wise, um, all with that end goal of getting information into ClinVar. One of the studies that we work with uh, is the National Brain Gene Registry. Um, and our main role is to help put that, that information into ClinVar from that study. Um, participants, after they enroll in the Brain Gene Registry, are asked to also enroll in Genome Connect to make that happen. So that tells you a little bit about why we've invited um, two of our lovely speakers here today to share a little bit more about this study, because we work really closely with them. So we're joined by Sanal Mahita, a genetic counselor and recruitment manager, and Maya Chopra, um, a physician and team lead of the Brain Gene Registry, to share a little bit more about this research study, the work that they're doing, um, and really the value to the genomics community and, and the scientific community and to patients. So with that, Sanal, uh, Maya, I think I'll turn it over to you both to share more about BGR. Thank you very much, Jules, for that introduction. And thank you for inviting us to participate in today's webinar and a big welcome to all of you who have joined. As this is a co-presentation, I'll start off with uh, really an introduction into the registry and what it's about, and then followed up by Sanal, who's very closely involved with recruitment um, and with the design of the study to give you some more information. Next slide. So I just wanted to introduce the concept of this Brain Gene Registry. We've got a lot of acronyms in this slide um, and throughout this, uh, this presentation. So we'll try and spell them out for you and explain what they all mean. But we'll introduce you to this registry, tell you about the consent process, how we evaluate individuals and what sets our registry apart, which is that we have an interactive component to obtain standardized information on neurobehavioral measures. Uh, and then some, some information about the, the other data points that are included in this registry. So we're just starting off here, stepping back. What we're interested in the Brain Gene Registry is, is of course, neurodevelopmental disorders. This group of disorders encompasses things like intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, epilepsy and language and communication difficulties, for example, which individually are quite rare in terms of their genetic etiologies. But when you pull all of these entities together, uh, they're actually, they actually pose a significant burden on the health system and a significant families to, a significant challenge to families and to the educational systems that support them. When we think about what we call the discovery cycle, what we're talking about is how we get from a genetic disorder through to de developing precision treatments, which is exactly where we want to get to. So we start there on the upper right uh, with uh, identifying a genetic cause for a neurodevelopmental disorder. And there are over a thousand, possibly 2000 individual genetic causes for neurodevelopmental disorders. We then think about once we really define and understand that disorder, the spectrum of symptoms and the types of genetic variants that impact uh, the group of individuals who, who have that diagnosis to really fully understand. And that's sort of at step two, taking a deep look at the full spectrum, the clinical symptoms for patients. We then think about modeling those disorders. In this case, we've got iPSCs. These are induced pluripotent stem cells. In this case, for example, they may be collected uh, via a skin biopsy from a patient transformed to stem cells, which are the type of cells that can be reprogrammed to any uh, any lineage um, that one is interested. And of course, brain disorders, we're interested in different types of neurons. So you may be able to develop this kind of model in order to test treatments. And then we use all of that information to test treatments in animals, which we then aspire to translate into clinical treatment trials for patients, which then feeds back to clinical care. So I think what we're trying to show in this graphic is that everything starts and everything ends and sometimes things iterate multiple times 
through patients and families like yourselves who are interested in research. And just those, just a note on those little acronyms in the middle, ASD is Autism Spectrum Disorder, and there are three examples of monogenic conditions that are implicated in autism, TSC, tuberous sclerosis com complex, fragile X syndrome and Rett syndrome. And these are some of the more commonly known conditions associated with autism that I said we're now looking at well over a thousand genes that are implicated in autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. Next slide. What's really challenging is that with over a thousand genes um, implicated in neurodevelopment, they have varying levels of evidence. So we have the types of genes that we just saw, for example, tuberous sclerosis, very well defined, very well known, very clearly implicated with neurodevelopment, right through if I opened a medical journal today where there's likely to be two or three genes that have been published in the last month um, that, that implicate a new gene in neurodevelopment. There's a significant burden for VUS, stands for Variance of Uncertain Classifications, and some of you may be familiar with this, but we'll go through what this means in more detail, but essentially it means an uncertain variant classification. But when you, when you go and see your doctor um, with a genetic test result, it's likely that the information they give you about that disorder is based on what is published, what's published in peer-reviewed journals. And we know that there's a bias towards those who are more significantly affected in the published literature. And sometimes there's even a bias in the way that a disorder is framed. For example, a gene might be framed as an epilepsy gene because that researcher is interested in epilepsy when in reality it can cause a range of neurodevelopmental phenotypes, it's more of a spectrum. Um, and then conversely, we have clinical test results, which often do not get shared. So of course, there are various mechanisms to have those variants shared on um, important sharing sites such as ClinVar, but many are not. And, and that makes it very difficult for that information to be used. And of course, it's partly that that would have drawn you to the Genome Connect effort. So the hypothesis uh, for the BGR, the Brain Gene Registry, is that clinical test results, if you pair them with detailed information about what we call the patient's phenotypes, so their, um, their neurobehavioral characteristics, their physical characteristics and their health history, can help to resolve uncertainty and eventually help us with that very, very critical foundational step towards developing targeted treatment. So we pair the clinical genomic data with a standardised neurobehavioural assessment and electronic health record data to help us better understand rare brain gene variants. Next slide. This initiative is funded by the NIH and is a consortium of centres called the IDDRCs, Intellectual and Developmental Disability Research Centres. And these are institutions uh, across the US an established network of researchers who collaborate to expand basic and translational research to better understand the causes of these disorders and to develop effective therapies for them. And I will say that although individuals who are existing patients of these institutions are, are clearly eligible and, and can, can enrol into the BGR, in fact, we're able to enrol individuals from outside of these centres um, by virtue of the, the pivot that we had to undertake because this study actually launched, launched right at the time of lockdown. So you don't need to be a patient of these centres in order to participate in the Brain Gene Registry. Next slide. This is just to show you, um, the again, the, the breadth of the sites that are involved. I will say that there are three lead sites. The whole initiative is led by our collaborators at Washington University in St. Louis, and, and they lead the effort to build the actual registry. It's a cloud-based registry. Um, we have our colleagues at the University of North Carolina who led the development of the neurobehavioral tool, the, the battery as we call it, which you'll hear about more about from Sinal. And we at Boston Children's are responsible for genetics. So we use the information from this registry to then curate genes in a standardized way, that is to look at the level of evidence that implicates this gene in neurodevelopmental disorders. And our hypothesis that we're able to um, understand a better and broader and more accurate spectrum of the condition by accessing clinical variants and clinical data seems to be holding true uh, based on our, our very pilot efforts thus far. And next slide. 
So I'm now going to hand it over to Sinal to get into more detail about eligibility and consent for this study. Thank you, Maya. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the eligibility and consent process and kind of what that looks like for participants. So I'm going to focus in on what's in the, the red circle, essentially. Um, but we have an eligibility kind of screening process, and patients can be identified through multiple modes. So sometimes research registries, um, colleagues who have patients who they know are eligible. We've had different sites that search their EHR um, in various ways to query kind of across the entire hospital or departments to see if any patients have genetic findings, a variance in certain genes, um, and then clinics as well. So our doctors, genetic counselors, um, other research assistants who might identify eligible patients who are then put through the eligibility screen and the consent process after that, which I'll go through a little bit more of each step along the way. So how to be referred or participate in the BGR. So the sites, um, like we said, can actively recruit you or your child or you know any other um, eligible member if you receive care in any of the clinics. Um, right now, main, mainly it's in the sites that are kind of leading the studies that are recruiting actively through clinics. And then anybody can actually go onto our website and fill out the website inquiry form from which we can contact you to set up, set you up in the enrollment process if you or your child are eligible. So I'm going to show you a little bit about what how that looks. Um, we do have a website. Um, that's the National Brain Gene Registry website. And anybody can go to the section for families and click on the enrollment tab, and it'll bring you to a registry interest form. And so when you fill out this information with your name and contact number and email, that goes to a Brain Gene Registry email at Children's, which myself and some of our co colleagues will monitor. And we will reach out and determine eligibility at that point and basically send you off to another site to be enrolled. So the whole consent process involves an eligibility check, then a consent call, and then multitude of evaluations, which I'll go through. And participants will dual enroll in Genome Connect during the consent process. So it's kind of a requirement of the BGR is that you dual enroll in Genome Connect as well, which Jules had introduced in the beginning. Um, so there's also a questionnaire that is filled out through that as well. So the eligibility check is pretty simple. Um, it's the sites will check eligibility by looking at the genetic test report, making sure you're eligible. If you're inquiring through the website or if somebody inquires through the website, you'll be sent a secure email link. And that's the link through which you can send the genetic test report for your patient or your child or yourself. And from there, we'll take it and look at the variant, make sure that you're eligible to actually enroll. And this is um, a study that is primarily in the US right now. So we are not enrolling internationally. We also have some language barriers as well. So we can enroll primary Spanish speaking families, but other than Spanish, we don't have the ability to enroll families who speak other languages just quite yet. So the current gene list is on our website as well. So on the Brain Gene Registry website, you can click on the genes of interest and it brings up the entire list of the genes that are there. Although you can also nominate other genes, we also have enrolled participants who don't have variants in this specific gene list, but still are genes of interest. So it doesn't necessarily have to be within this gene list. Um, we can enroll essentially anybody with a change in a brain gene. So what constitutes eligibility when you're looking at the screen? So what do we look at when we look at a genetic test report? is a variant of uncertain significance or a VUS or above in any gene that is implicated in neurodevelopment. So we do focus in a little bit on our genes of interest, but we do, again, we can enroll any participant who has a variant in a brain gene as long as it's classified as a VUS or above. So when you get a genetic test report, you'll get a classification for the genetic change that's found, and it can range from this VUS or variant of uncertain significance to likely pathogenic and pathogenic. And so any variant that is classified as one of these three are eligible for enrollment in the brain gene registry. The benign and likely benign variants are not eligible as those are mostly kind of population variants that likely are not the cause for somebody's symptoms or participant's symptoms. And so we do take VUS or above when we're looking at those reports. 
So um, questions that we get are kind of why are we interested in these VUS findings if they're uncertain? And so from kind of the clinical perspective, the VUS findings are often the most difficult results for families to kind of grapple with and deal with because they bring about a lot of uncertainty in regards to diagnosis. Um, and so we want to enroll these individuals with VUSs or variants of uncertain significance because the brain gene registry and the way that our evaluations work can potentially help to relieve some of that uncertainty in the future if we can take closer a closer look at those individuals and the genetic changes as well as their symptoms. So we can use this data um, with the VUS that we take in a standardized way, which I'll go over a little bit more in order to kind of help us curate or take a standardized look at the genetic changes as well as that specific gene. And sometimes this can lead to a change in classification. If we have a variant of uncertain significance, it might be kind of upgraded to something that is a little less uncertain. So just kind of another, um, I know Jules went over a little bit of this, but the participants will dual enroll in Genome Connect. So it's also a patient registry. And along the way in the consent process, the participants fill out the Genome Connect questionnaire as well. And that data integrates into the BGR data. So we can also use that data to be able to help us with gene curation or look taking a look at specific genetic changes or specific genes. So I'm going to go a little bit into the evaluation process. So what's actually involved once you consent to being enrolled in the BGR and kind of the time commitment as well as the actual evaluations. So this is um, the RNAP, which is the assessment or battery that we're using that was created by the University of North Carolina team um, led by Heather Hazlett. So this is a standardized way of collecting information for the, the individuals who are enrolled in the brain gene registry. The RNAP stands for the Rapid Neurobehavioral Assessment Protocol, and it's a set of tools that will assess different domains that are relevant to intellectual and developmental disabilities. So it can be used for a broad age range. It also uses a lot of existing tools and assessments that are often used in clinic anyhow and can be done via telehealth and doesn't have to be done by an MD specifically. So we have certain training protocols that we can use to train um, research assistants and other members of the team to actually do these via telehealth. These are the domains that we assess within the RNAP. So cognitive abilities, adaptive functioning, autism or autistic symptoms, motor and sensory symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, neurologic concerns, and then physical features. So some of these are done through caregiver report or questionnaires that parents or guardians will fill out. And then some of them are direct assessment or using a telehealth visit to actually have somebody assess them. So the two main components of the RNAP are the questionnaires or the participant reports, the caregiver reports that they fill out themselves. And then there are also a couple of things that are conducted via telehealth visits. So an actual visit with one of the research assistants, a coordinator, a doctor, somebody on the team at the site that's enrolling. The questionnaires are given to participants participants via email through REDCap. It's a link that's generated once you enroll and consent to the process. And then you can fill out the questionnaires on your own time. They can be done all at the same time in batches. You can start one and then finish it later. Um, they are time intensive. They take approximately 90 to 120 minutes depending on symptoms for any given child. Um, but they are pretty comprehensive. So we get a lot of information from them. It is all parent reported though. And then there's the direct assessment, which is approximately 30 to 45 minutes um, for each session, depending on the need for different autism screeners. So during that time, they do cognitive evaluations, neurologic evaluations or screeners, and then the dysmorphology screener, which is looking at different facial features, fingers, toes, kind of looking for any differences. Um, depending on how many of these need to be done, it can take up to you know 45 minutes to an hour um, per report from our research assistants who have done this. So what is the benefit of doing these kind of standardized, taking the time out to do these questionnaires and the telehealth visits? Um, because for some families, it is very time intensive to kind of go through all of this. But the RNAP is a standardized way of assessing the child. So you or your child's development, it can be used to better understand the genetic disorder. Oftentimes, when we're trying to compare 
patients or figure out, you know, is this gene really the cause for a certain set of symptoms? We don't have standardized information. We have information that's collected from various different sources, different clinics, uh, maybe just kind of a couple of parent reports, anecdotal things. And so it's better if we have the standard of the information that we're collecting on multiple individuals that we can actually compare to each other and then use that for helping us to better understand the genes, better understand the variants and the relationship between the genetic change and the actual gene. So we keep mentioning curation. Um, and so curation is really this, a standardized process by which we can evaluate genes and evaluate a gene's link to specific symptoms. So having the standardized information from the RNAP can help us then use that information to go through the standardized process of actually looking at a gene, looking at symptoms, and telling if it's actually linked to those symptoms or not. We can also curate, curate variants. So if there's a variant of uncertain significance, we're trying to figure out if it's the cause for a participant, having the RNAP data can really help with that um, and let us kind of figure out, like, is this change real or is it part of normal variation? The end goal of this is always, of course, to have targeted therapeutics. So targeted therapies for different genetic disorders as we understand them better and can kind of model those and figure out what to target. So that's the consent process, um, eligibility screen, kind of all of what happens when you enroll. And then we have the back end where we have all of this data that is kind of in this cloud-based platform. And so what happens to that data? Who can access it? Who can use it? Um, a lot of questions that come up as parents and families are consenting to this process. So what happens to the data? So once you enroll in BGR and complete all the evaluations, the identifiable data is only available to the site that enrolls you. So they can link that data back to a specific patient, name, date of birth, kind of all of the demographic information that they have because they have enrolled you. But de-identified data is available to other outside researchers upon request and approval by the BGR lead sites. So the goal of BGR was really to create this cloud-based commons where all of this information would be publicly available for others to look at, to compare, and to help us better understand these neurodevelopmental disorders. Going along with that, it is all publicly available upon request, um, but it's all de-identifiable. So de-identified data that gets shared with any outside researchers. We have a process that they have to go through in order to request this data and then be approved. Um, they have to answer questions, have appropriate research models in place, and then that de-identified de data is pushed over to individuals in the form of like Excel spreadsheets, things like that with no names or dates of birth or anything, just diagnoses, MRI findings, things of that nature. Genetic data is also shared public to publicly available databases such as ClinVar, which, I'll, which I know Jules went through, and I'll show you a little bit of the snapshot, but it's not identifiable. So the only identifiable information is to the enrolling site specifically. So this is just a snapshot. Um, so Genome Connect, a brain gene registry, um, our team is a submitter to ClinVar, which is this publicly available database of genetic variants. And so this is a snapshot as to kind of some of the things that we have been able to contribute to ClinVar so far. So the variants will go into ClinVar where other people can look and they can tell you know, how many we've put in there, what the classification is, and kind of some more information as well if they're comparing different genes, different changes. Just to highlight, um, we do use the data to hopefully get information out to the public. So we have two kind of main publications so far, so a data snapshot and then kind of looking at our clinical variants that we have paired with the, the standardized phenotypes that we have um, and how we can use this resource to actually help gene curation along. I just wanted to acknowledge all of our sites um, and our lead investigators and our participants and families as well and our ClinGen team, including those who are on the call today. And these are just the websites um, to learn more about BGR. And you can always email the BGR email if you have any questions. Um, it's monitored by myself and some of our other colleagues. And so we're always happy to field any questions that you have about the Brain Gene Registry through that email as well. 
Thanks so much for that overview, Maya and Sanal. We now have a little bit of time for some questions. If anyone has them, feel free to put them in that Q&A box, which should be at the bottom of your screen or on your cell phone. Um, we do ask for general questions. We won't have an opportunity to answer specific questions about your genetic testing or your child's question genetic testing, but happy to answer general questions about the Brain Gene Registry, Genome Connect, um, and the work that we're doing. While we wait to see if there are any questions that come in through the q and I'm curious, um, Maya and Sanal, when you look at your current participants, I know you talked about VUS or above. Do most participants have VUSs? Are most path, likely path? Can you speak a little bit about the, the breakdown of participants currently? Yeah, they have kind of sat steady at most of them being VUSs actually, um, and followed by pathogenic and then likely pathogenic. So majority of them that we have in there currently are VUS. Um, it was mostly kind of about 60% were VUSs followed by, you know, 15 and then, you know, a little, there's a small portion that are likely pathogenic, but majority of them are variants of uncertain significance as of now. Um, Many of the, the results that we have on there that are eligible were our panel results, which oftentimes leads to more variants of uncertain significance. So that's where I think that also comes from. Thanks for that. And does the process of participation, you went through it beautifully, does it change at all based on gene, based on variant classification? Or is it that same pathway, same data collection kind of across genes and variants? Yep. Same across genes, variants, um, as long as they have an eligible variant, um, then it's the same process for every participant. And then since we're on sort of variants classifications, I'm curious about um, whether the BGR team offers opinions, classification of variants as part of participation. And I can share a little bit about what Genome Connect does or doesn't do if that's helpful, but from the BGR side, Sanal and Maya, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I might I might, answer, might, might take that one. I think that's a really common question. Um, it's, a, it's a research study. So we do look at variants and we do look at data, but we don't do direct reinterpretations or offer opinions um, or reclassifications on those variants. So I think the contribution is at a higher level that we might look at, for example, a set of variants in a gene and say, hey, these were all reported as uncertain, but we, we really think this is a disease gene. And we would put that public knowledge out there through our curations. This really is a disease gene. And then we'd kind of link up with Genome Connect, um, who can uh, let Jules then speak to how they might address that in terms of feeding back to participants. But the answer is no, we don't. We don't offer clinical opinions or reinterpretations through the BGR framework. Thanks, Maya. I know it's a common question because we get it as well as part of Genome Connect. And we also don't independently classify variants. So we, as our genetic counseling team, our team of uh, researchers, we don't independently classify every variant on participants' reports. But if we become aware of changes based on our data sharing, that is information that we feed back to our participants. So one way is when we submit to ClinVar, sometimes we see that that reporting laboratory, so the lab who did the child's testing, um, now classifies that variant differently. And so that's information that will feed back to participants. We also sometimes see that curations from ClinGen, which you talked about so nicely, Sonal, have shifted. And maybe that gene didn't have a relationship to disease when reported, was a candidate gene, but now has a more definitive tie to disease. That's information that will feed back to participants as well if we see that as we're sharing data. So really, if there's a, a shift based on what we can see when we share with ClinVar or what's in ClinGen, that information will feed back. It is an optional piece of participation. So as part of consent, participants choose whether or not they want to receive that from us, and they can update their preferences over time. Um, and we always say we're not going to identify every single update and direct folks to check in with their genetic counselors regularly or their physicians regularly, um, really to make sure that they're up to date on what's going on with their genetic test results, what they mean, what other testing referrals might be warranted. So that's how we handle it within Genome Connect. Thanks for that, Maya. Thanks for that, Sanal. In terms of um, families, uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, sometimes we know that a family might have, and if you did talk about this and I missed it, apologies, 
they might have multiple children with the same genetic change, or sometimes it's inherited from a parent where mom or dad has that same genetic change. Um, do you enroll multiple family members? Do you enroll adults? Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, we actually will enroll anyone who has the variant. So we do have um, families in the registry who have uh, an inherited variant from a reportedly unaffected or mildly affected parent. Um, and actually it's helpful when we enroll a parent who is you know, either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic because we can also get the standardized assessments on them as well. Um, so we do as much as we can with the assessments that we have and we'll enroll any, any of the kids that have it within the family. We also enroll parents. Um, so there's not really a limit as long as we deem the variant to be eligible and it's not something that you know is ineligible for any reason. Thanks, Sonal. We do have a question from an audience member asking about the standardized clinical data, what you're collecting. Is that captured longitudinally? So is it one and done? Do you capture it over the lifetime moving forward? Can you talk a little bit about that? I can take that one. That's a really good question, especially because we know that the best way to define and delineate rare genetic disorders and to develop treatments for them is to track them longitudinally. So, for example, if we're defining a disorder and we enroll a child who's three and say the child does not have epilepsy, maybe it's not part of this disorder, then he develops epilepsy at the age of four. We haven't captured that. Um, at this stage, the brain gene registry is cross-sectional, so it's a one-time data collection, data from the neurobehavioral assessment, data from the EHR. But I think, you know, the aspiration is that it would be great if we were able to um, expand the infrastructure to be able to collect data longitudinally. Having said that, we've consented all our, our participants that this is a one-time collection. So if we were to move into that direction, let's say we, you know, we're, we're fortunate enough to have the resources to do so, all of those participants would, would be recontacted and reconsented um, to do, for example, you could say, what if we did an EHR pool um, every year? Or what if we did the neurobehavioral test assessment, the RNAP, every one to two years? That would definitely enrich uh, our understanding of these disorders. Um, so I think that's a great question, but again, not something we're doing yet, but perhaps aspirational in the future. Thanks, Maya. A couple more questions that I have and then we'll wrap up for the day. Um, does participating in the BGR help or facilitate connections with other researchers, other studies at all? Um, so if a researcher comes to you and asks for more data and wants to invite participants to participate in another study. Is that something you all are able to do? What does that look like, if so? Go ahead, Sonal. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so potentially, um, right now we have, you know, the de-identified data sharing as part of the consent. Um, but if there was like another eligible study for something, we could always, there's no there's there's nothing that says that we can't like recontact a participant or they can't be told about a study. Um, don't think that's come up really quite yet. Um, as far as like having a, a study that participants are all like a group of participants are eligible for, but we do have you know data access requests that are going in for like certain groups of genes, things like that, where they're looking at all of the data. We just haven't been asked like, can we enroll all these participants in a certain type of study quite yet? Um, but I foresee that if that came up, we could probably, you know, Jeff probably work with other groups to do that as well. Thanks for that, Sonal. And it's great to hear uh, that the de-identified data are being used and looked at to answer questions around these genes and variants. So I think that's the first step before we get to future studies. And it's great to hear that that's happening. All right, I'm gonna check to make sure I'm not missing any more questions. I think I have captured them. All right, so with that, Maya and Sonal, I really just want to thank you both for joining us today, talking a little bit more about the Brain Gene Registry, how it works with Genome Connect and all the fantastic work that you all are doing to better understand brain genes, their relationship to health and um, what we see in, in families, individuals with variants in those genes. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Thanks for sharing your time. And thanks to our attendees today for listening. Really appreciate you all um, taking the time to sit with us as well. As a reminder, we'll have that October webinar about ClinVar, which you heard lots about today. But if you want to know more about how to search ClinVar, how to track a variant in ClinVar, um, the ClinVar team will be joining us. I know Caitlin placed the uh, registration link in the chat, 
and we'd be happy to have you there as well. So with that, we'll close out. Have a lovely rest of your Tuesday um, and thanks again.